All right, so it looks like we're recording. Um, just a reminder of the antitrust policy notice. Uh, all meetings are attended by people who are uh, potentially industry competitors and, uh, you know, make sure that you're not talking about anything that you don't want to be talking about that might uh, violate any antitrust policies. So with that, uh, we will head to the agenda. All right, so this is our agenda for today. Uh, we'll be talking about just reminding you about the events. Uh, obviously, the people who are on this call know that the TSC has changed to a new Zoom link. Uh, I also put that in the TSC chat. Uh, we'll do a quarterly update, uh, talk about the crypto live uh, proposal, and then uh, talk about the testnet, uh, have some discussion about the testnet. So with that, uh, Dan, do you want to kick us off? Yeah. Yeah, though I think you've already pretty much kicked us. Uh, so uh, uh, just adding to the, the usual reminders as, as we're going this morning that uh, everybody is welcome in this meeting and the rest of our technical working group meetings and everybody's welcome to contribute code to any of our projects. Uh, and if you're not certain how to behave in any of these forums, we do have a code of conduct that you can find from the hyperledger.org webpage. Uh, but in short, just be respectful of everybody around you. Uh, in addition to the topics that uh, are listed on this slide, we had planned on uh, having the update from the Composer team. Uh, and I know from their last update that they're going through some changes, but if anybody has a connection to somebody who's actively involved there, uh, it would be good for them to uh, check in with us and let us know what's going on there. Um, and I think probably our, uh, our largest topic for today then is going to be the update from the training and education group. So uh, I will hand off to her. Can you unshare first? I'm still getting that I cannot share uh, while the participant is sharing. Hey, Rye, I don't know if you can uh, hand the ball over. Oh, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not exactly sure. Is there like a promote to presenter? Rye, if you just unshare the agenda slide, then you should be good to go. Done. I mean, I, I unshared. Okay. I think, uh, Reboot. <laughs> Does everyone see it? Yes. Okay. This is the update, as you know, of the training and education working group. Um, first, regarding the working group health, we had changed our meeting time from 10 o'clock PST to 8 o'clock PST due to requests from Chinese uh, participants from China, and then for whatever reason, they did not attend the meetings, and we had several people who could not attend at 8 a.m., and everyone understood that this was on a trial basis. Now that the U.S. is going to be going through a time change, everyone agreed to go ahead and move it back to the 10 o'clock so that some of our original core attendees uh, would be able to participate again. If we receive further requests from participants in China, then we might consider having a second once a month type of an update so that we can be inclusive. One of the key things that we've talked about in the last couple of times that I've updated you is that the name of our group is causing us some issue. I think that what happens, as I've mentioned before, is that participants are in the edX course and at the end of the edX course they're invited to join one of the working groups. They're a little nervous perhaps about the names of some of the working groups and then there is training and education which feels like the next step. And so I would say about two-thirds of the people that join our group are coming to get training and education rather than to contribute to training and education and we kind of go around and around about that. They're looking for 
a continuation of the edX course as much as they're looking to participate in a working group. And so we've talked about names and I think Tracy came up with the best name, which is the Learning Materials Development Working Group. And we would like to put this out to uh, your group to have some discussion on. Again, trying to find the right set of words that differentiate that we are creating and developing materials rather than this is a place to receive training. Any comments? Um, yeah, this is Mark from the Performance and Scale Working Group. We have a similar thing where a lot of people coming in just want us to solve their performance problems. Um, you know, and so I think some of it gets back to even just the website. The website still doesn't really do much for working working groups that says, you know, hey, this is what this working group does, come join. Um, you sort of have to hunt through and find a wiki and, and go read what's there. I mean, we list all the projects on the front page, but we don't list the working groups. So um, you're not alone. Let me put it that way. Anyone else? Hi, uh, this is Alice the... from... Go ahead, Salis. Do we still have audio? I still have. Yeah. I think we've gotten too little exponential back off problem there. Silas, carry on. Silas might have carried off. Um, was it? Yeah, maybe. Bawa I also maybe, heard. Yeah, maybe I just uh, suggest we can make the name a little shorter, like uh, the Learning Development Working Group. How about that? Okay. Uh, this is Dan. I'm I'm all for a name change, and I, I understand the frustration that you've expressed earlier too. There, so uh, maybe uh, if people want to give some other ideas out on on the mail list, you might generate some other concepts that that start off with some active term, so that it's clear that it's a it's a contribution kind of thing and not a consuming kind of thing. Okay. I thought Tracy's suggestion was good. Yeah, of the two, I think I prefer the one from Tracy, but I, I kind of don't think I have a vote here. I don't know that it has to be perfect. It's more, I hate to say a filter, but it's more a clarifier that this is what we're doing. So obviously there are opportunities for contributions for people who are new to the space, such as, you know, editing and things like that. But um, we're spending a lot of time answering questions like, what is GitHub and um, how do I connect into Google Docs? And it, it, I, as you know, we've had some momentum issues. We seem to have kind of a third of our group who are creating materials and then two thirds of our group who are, because we're kind of doing them a disservice because they're coming expecting to receive training. And not only are we as a group not developing enough content, but the people who are coming to receive training are not getting what it is that their expectation is. And so even though we're trying to support their efforts and kind of guide them in this direction or that direction, it's difficult because of the amount of time, and I know that all of the groups are experiencing this, but people who want to learn also need to set aside the time to learn. And so it, I think that they're thinking it's more of a, we're a trainer to them, and so we're gonna save them time rather than investing the time in learning so that they can contribute to the group. So I like the idea of putting the list out. We talked about training and education development, learning materials development, um, learning development, et cetera. So we'll put those out to the group, but Tracy um, suggested that it would be good to find out if, if you had any particular 
uh, preferences or because you're working across groups, if there were any particular words that you thought would not work as much as words that you thought might work. Any other comments or would you like me to move on to the next item? Yeah, feel free to move on from there. Okay. Do we, do we need to do anything as a TSC or is it up to the working group to just change the name on their own? Um, I, you know, I, we should probably agree to whatever the the name is. I don't. I don't think we're gonna. Uh, I don't expect any of us is is gonna have a any reluctance to approve whatever the the uh, predominant name is. Okay. Well, I'd make a motion to change it as uh, Tracy suggested. For me. Kelly, did you want other names considered first, or if you're happy with that one, we can move forward with that? I'm happy with that name, and also I would like us to move forward as a group with our content, but we could spend three months discussing the name as well. Right. So I think that this really solidifies what it is that we're doing, and uh, will be a step forward. So I'm good to go with this one if everyone is in agreement. Okay. Shall we have a vote then? Um, yeah. All, all in favor, say aye. 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 I think I almost counted eleven there. Um, all opposed, uh, please see say say nay. All right. Any abstention? Anybody abstaining? All right. Sounds like we have an anonymous, or, or not an anonymous. Uh, Unanimous uh, sort of approval here. So we'll go ahead and uh, work on getting the name changed to Learning Materials Development Working Group. Obviously, there's a few things we'll have to change uh, related to chat, mailing lists, and those sorts of things, but we'll go ahead and get that changed. The next thing that we're going to discuss regarding issues is that, um, as you know, I've been working as the kind of working group administrator, and I'm going to be making a change there. I'll still be involved in the group and will support whoever is the working group administrator. Um, I've talked to Tracy and David and will be leading a subgroup project on smart contracts and purposefully calling that smart contracts because we want to be able to start to expand and scale understanding of chain code and understanding of the role of the various projects in relationship to smart contracts. And so what we're going to do is with two or three participants from our group or new participants come up with one use case and then when it's complete another use case and we will create smart contracts within that or for that use case across the projects and then kind of review how it is that each project was approached. Also, there will be some step-by-step -step tutorials because what we're finding as a working group is that everyone wants to contribute to about articles, um, about white papers, everything from governance to um, what is the future of blockchain. But in the edX courses and in the various forums, we see a lot of struggle with ac the actual technical implementation. And so we'd like to present a use case. Um, we talked about starting with one that Tracy had begun earlier and um, we will write that out, do kind of a mock needs assessment, talk about the size of the quote company, et cetera. And then how would you approach that? Or what is the relationship, potential relationship with uh, sawtooth, what's the potential relationship, et cetera, et cetera. And do a tutorial and then really kind of talk about um, what we ran into, what considerations an organization might want to consider, et cetera, et cetera. So the use case is really a combination of a use case with almost a POC or a tutorial geared toward a portion of a POC so that we can begin to address what we see people stumbling on, which is really the implementation. What, several years ago, many moons ago, when Java first came out with Sun Microsystems, we I worked at a college where we really saw that it wasn't getting past early adopters at that time. And so we started trying to think of how we can expand to products that are familiar at the outset and then went into the technical detail rather than starting with the technical detail and working 
um, the way to a product. So with Tracy, we'll be working up kind of a, a list of things that we're considering and then reaching out to the other groups regarding, hey, we're thinking about, is this the right approach or this is what we were thinking about for this use case using your, um, your project. So it'll be um, within the training and education work group, but will obviously um, involve the other groups as well. That sounds like that will be really valuable. Um, and since the, the working group agenda is yours to define, along with your other active participants, there's, there's no reason in my mind you couldn't consider just making this the topic for, for your meetings. Um, continue to, to pursue it the way that, that you're indicating here too, but do think about just setting the, the topics for the agenda in a way that accomplishes mm -hmm. the things that you want to accomplish. Yeah. So yeah, our, I was going to add to it too that you know part of the part of the thing here was I know back in uh, June when we were in Amsterdam we talked about kind of what's an, what's an easy way for people to get started with the different projects and and so you know the idea here was really if we're looking across the different projects with some uh, one one particular use case that we could apply across the board. Um, that it helps people kind of, you know, dig in and, and get uh, familiar with the different projects, really understand kind of, you know, what the what the right choices are for them um, based on their particular use case. So um, that was a, a, another kind of let's bring in some of the things that we've talked about in the past to to this new well this renamed working group, right, and, and focusing on that. So our overall activity in the past um, quarter, we worked on the uh, markdown for the edX materials and then came up with the end user and decision maker concepts list. The original was begun when we had the last quarterly meeting. Sorry, I coughed a little bit. Now I've got a frog in my throat. And then expanded that a little bit this kind of concepts list has been a little bit of a round and around for us because it showed how readily and easily the group is distracted. The idea is good, but you can go down a lot of rabbit holes. And that's what we found was taking up a lot of time, which pretty much led to the um, contribution also of, of changing the names and then tightening up the agendas. So, at this point, that particular group is also in planned work products, wants to complete that and then uh, start writing more of an academic article on the effects on a democratic society. And so because we have people in the group that are interested in contributing at more of a future level or a, a research level, um, that's one of the reasons we decided to go with a smart contract project so that we could really balance that with the implementation that we're seeing that people are looking for. In addition, I created a prototype script and, and a prototype animation um, to help with some understanding of the concepts. And so the group looked at the prototype animation and made a couple of comments. We're uh, working now on six additional scripts. So we'll kind of go with that style of video and then that can be incorporated, you know, across different learning, you know, whether it be something that links from read the docs or whether it be something that people take into a course project. We have a small project status list and it's just kind of a contact list. Um, and then we started in order to get contributions. We've got a lot more people on the mailing list than we have showing up in the meetings. So we decided um, every time that we have a meeting at the top of the wiki, we're going to kind of put current current projects and current needs. And then also we've been following up with a, this is what happened in the meeting and here are ways that you can contribute over the next two weeks, kind of a scrum type of a viewpoint. But we were getting, again, more people who said, yeah, I would really love to learn that then. Um, so that's kind of the shift that we're trying to make. As far as our planned work products goes, they're finishing the 
final edit on the 36 concepts and want to begin the article that I mentioned. Uh, they're also starting a fabric concepts definition document outline. Um, the smart contracts I brought up earlier under issues and then we will by our next TSC report have uh, additional of these animation videos. We've been having a consistent approximate 10 contributors. We have more people on our mailing list, about 200, and we have more people that show up to the meetings. But usually we've got 10 people who are actually creating learning material. So I hope to have um, a much more kind of a productive or more focused report next time. You know, I think that we're getting there. It's not, it's, it's a good group, but just a little bit not on the charter. And so that's why I've asked us in our next meeting, we'll be reminding and reviewing the charter so that we can keep things more in a going forward in developing materials mode. All right, well, thanks for the update, Kelly, and thanks for volunteering your time to, to keep this working group going forward and, and just getting it off the ground to begin with. No, I really appreciate Tracy too. She's been instrumental in kind of getting us through the, the little, the few bumps that we've had. <clears throat> yes, Tracy is uh, very helpful all around the board at Hyperledger. But don't let that go to your head, Tracy. No worries, it's not going to my head. <laughs> but thank you for the uh, kind words. Okay, uh, I think we're ready to move on then to uh, oh, wait, Hunt's Dan, update. Dan, I had one question. I mean, uh, this is Arnaud speaking. So um, I was looking at the documents that you already have started drafting. And so there is this thing about like, there is a document on concept and uh, you list a bunch of things. And my only question is, does that, how does that relate to what's being done by the architecture working group? Because I see some form of overlap uh, in that their reference architecture group is defining this kind of concept, right? In a way which is meant to be general, uh, general enough to apply to the different frameworks we, uh, we at least know of and, uh, and developing within Hyperledger. And uh, I'm not saying there's a problem, <laughs> let's be clear. I was just wondering if, you know, those things match with one another. Is that something you, you keep an eye on? Um, we reached out to the other groups and asked for um, comments on this particular list. I know that the person that's been working on it has been attending the fabric meetings, uh, but I don't know that he's been attending the architecture meetings, but I can um, ask him about that and ask him to check in with that group for sure. Yeah. yeah. And the architecture working group has already published a few documents. So it'd be good if we produce new material that it's at least a line. And, you know, I think it can have a different angle, you know, point of view and a different audience. And there, there's, I'm not saying this is duplicative by any means, but you don't want to be contradicting either, right? We should be consistent with all the documents we produce. Sure, understood. Right. And this is Mark. I had a similar comment. Um, it looked like you were defining terms, some of which we've defined in the metrics white paper, which are also, you know, I think the metrics white paper aligns with the architecture group. Okay. Um, and I'm not, I didn't go back and compare to see how, you know, whether they contradict mm -hmm. or not. I'll, I'll take an action item to do that. But I didn't know in general if we want, you know, like one, one list of terms that all the different working groups can refer to or if it makes sense to have them in each paper. Hi, this is Alesh. Uh, I also have a question why we are focusing on fabric concepts and definitions and not go across all platforms that are under the hyperledger. In this case, it's because we have very few volunteers and because our volunteers are kind of at the level of experience where they can select one thing and go into that one thing. I don't think that they have the experience to write across. And so I think 
the idea was this is a starting place. It's a fledgling group who are learning at the same time. And so it's, I think we have one person who attends several of the uh, fabric meetings and that's kind of the amount that he's able to both contribute and absorb at this point. But if this group has ideas, one thing that we did do is we last quarter put a note into each of the working groups to please let us know if there are things that we could collaborate and contribute on. And we did hear back um, from Iroa and worked with them on some documentation, but we didn't hear back from others. So it's good for this group to help us to prioritize and understand where to connect. What we have are a handful of people who are saying, okay, I think I know enough about this now that I can start to work on it versus people in this group who have a much better under overall understanding, which is one of the reasons why we're changing the name of the group. It all just kind of feeds back into that le level of experience of the group, individuals in the group. Yeah, this actually also happens in the technical working group in China. When we start the uh, translation work, we found uh, the volunteers that are familiar with fabric, but uh, can only find a few ones are uh, familiar with other platforms. So on the end user and decision maker concepts list, then I'll ask that group to talk with the architecture group to look at the defined metrics white paper and to, I will post in each of the different working groups, uh, you know, maybe please take a look at this, et cetera. If it turns out that this is not what this group finds relevant or if it's not the right approach, that's fine because one thing that it's done is kind of gotten our people engaged. If it turns out to be just an internal reference, um, or if it turns out to be nothing, that's fine. It, it's, it serves its purpose, which is to get people putting something down on paper and to get them looking at the different working groups at the different documentation, et cetera. Yeah, I, I do like the direction that you were setting of trying to create some some concrete examples and, and growing out from there. I think that'll be a more productive use of, of your and the rest of your group's time than than uh, uh, trying to make high level papers that might end up uh, with some of these duplicating or, or conflicting concepts that the uh, the other folks here just mentioned. Okay, and, and with that, uh, we should probably move along in the agenda. So thanks again, Kelly. Uh, and then uh, Hart, you are up. Awesome, thanks, Dan. Um, just uh, reaching for the mute button. So I guess we should just continue the discussion we had last week. So I will say uh, we have uh, updated the proposal to reflect a lot of the changes in feedback that people gave at the last meeting, in particular, uh, Chris's suggestion about uh, maintainer lists rather than stewards was a good one. And, and we have uh, we have changed the proposal to reflect that. Um, so I guess I don't want to exactly rehash what we what I presented last week or what we said. So um, I, I'll open up the floor to questions, comments, uh, anything like that. This is Mark. I was happy with the changes. Awesome. Does anybody else have other questions or comments or? Hawaii, not Montreal. You say why not Montreal? I think you said Hawaii. No, I not said Montreal. Hawaii, not Montreal. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, that question will have to go when we move it to the uh, 
the official uh, repo, I guess. Darn. Anybody else? I mean, uh, Chris, did those changes reflect what you thought? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, no, I'm good with it. All right. All right, this is Dave Hughesby. I was really um, pleased to see those modifications. It really clarifies us a lot along the lines with all of um, Yeah, the risk of adding to the deafening silence. Uh, I I'm good with it. This, this looks like a nice proposal. Okay. Well, I, I see no reason to uh, belabor this further. Uh, Hart, uh, would you like uh, us to move this forward? Sure. All right. Well, why don't we take a vote to approve the, uh, the CryptoLib proposal? Uh, so I do have a question before we vote. Um, did we decide on a name for this? Uh, we have a tentative name choice. Uh, it is Ursa. We need to run it through with the marketing committee, though. And I was actually going to ask about what's the protocol for doing that. So I think in the past we've approved projects and then they've gone and figured out what the name is with the marketing committee afterwards. I think that's what we did with the, the interledger proposal. Yeah. I think I'm bringing that wrong. We did. You're yeah. And I, I, you know, I, I don't know what was done for sawtooth, but I know for fabric IBM did a, you know, a, um, you know, we did a search so we may want to do a search, but you know, with the qualification of Hyperledger Fubar, it it should be okay. Um, but uh, having having the uh, marketing marketing committee and and probably um, uh, our legal beagles approve it would be good. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about. Um, so if I I'll follow up. Uh, who should I talk to on the LF staff about this? Um, hmm. a good well, question. Um, yeah, the, the marketing committee. Yeah, so, so it's probably worthwhile just sending to marketing at hyperledger.org. Um, yeah. it, it'd be Dan O'Prey and, and now uh, Alyssa, I think. Um, is the yeah. vice chair. Um, I already was going to send through Dan. I was wondering if there was like a legal someone or something that I needed to. Well, that they'll work with uh, council. Okay. That would be perfect. Just send them all the marketing and uh, they'll, you know. Okay. All right. So then um, I guess we're ready for our vote then. We'll, uh, we'll get Hart, you interact with the marketing committee and, and we'll figure out the name, but is uh, I'll move. all the who you'll move for yep. the vote, oh, Chris? Okay. Second. Great. All right. Uh, all those in favor of the crypto the proposal uh, becoming a project within Hyperledger, uh, say aye. 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 All right. All those opposed, nay. Anybody abstaining? All right, sounds like we have approval. Um, so Hart, if you wouldn't mind just following up with the market, so we'll go from there. Awesome, uh, thank you, Tracy. Yeah, once we get the the name, we can set up all the uh, all the mailing lists and chat channels, and well, I guess you know maybe we name chat channels if we have to, um, and uh, yeah, get it set up on the website as well. So. Thanks a lot, hey, Art. Um, Art, did you incorporate the RFC repo in the the final uh, proposal? Uh, no, but I have a link saying that you know this is what we're thinking of doing, and it will probably change heavily. So I implied it, but I okay. didn't link the most recent content. Okay, yeah, I, I just I want went, to make sure Tracy knew. Yeah, I was just going to say some of the some of the proposals have a resources section at the end where they list the the requested. Um, repos and, and we don't have it in that proposal but but yeah we can sort out those details we at least want 
two or, or yeah. three repos was, off of that. It was just a decision we made yesterday morning, so I was making sure it got into the into the repo setup. Hey Dave, what was that? Uh, what what was the agreement? So we can we can update you offline. I don't think it's okay. That's yeah, we'll do it off. Yeah. All right, and uh, Dave, you're actually going to be the the next on the list here. Congratulations first to uh, Hart and and the rest of the crew, which is actually quite a few of us here. Uh, it's on, quite a big that. crew, so thanks everybody. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a long time. Uh, was it back in LA that we started that, or was it even before then? Uh, I believe Nathan likes to point out that it was on the bus in Madrid. <laughs> All right, Lisbon. Yeah, it's been a long time. Coming. Lisbon, sorry, More not Madrid. Year. Yeah, yep. The double decker bus. Yeah, on the bus in Lisbon. Yep, I will. I will corroborate that story. All right. Well, that's nice. Trams. Trams. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Dan, sorry, I lost the agenda list here. What What am I talking about? So, uh, if you're prepared for more discussion on testnet, we have time for that. If that's not a discussion that you've uh, that you think that we need to take more verbal no, I, time for. Um. Yeah, there is no agreement so far. There's no idea. Like, we haven't even settled on exactly what the needs are for a testnet. Um, I mean, of course, the, the, uh, the story that I proposed was that we run like a Kubernetes fabric and, or, you know, a Kubernetes, um, sorry, instance, and we can compensate people for, you know, some amount of usage of that. But um, I don't see a consensus developing around any of the proposals. So I would like to gather feedback right now from the community, from the TSC, about what a testnet means to them like what would you like to see because there's a huge range from you know as brian likes to joke why can't this just be a cluster of raspberry pies <laughs> all the way up to do we have you know big iron running somewhere that can really right. do performance testing so so um, so but dave i think i think it gets to the sort of the um the fundamental distinction of is this a uh, sort of a, a Kubernetes replacement for what we already have with OpenStack you, through DigitalOcean or whoever our provider is, I can't remember. Uh, or um, is it intended to be where Sawtooth and Fabric and Burrow and, and, and Aroha and so forth are all stood up and people can kick the tires as users of these things? There's, they're very different beasts, right? I mean, one is an extension of our CI that allows us to do scale and performance and various other types of testing that's, um, you know, more than we, what we can do by just testing inside a single VM. Uh, right now, I think all of the CI is basically just grabbing a VM and doing Docker Compose up and down uh, to, to, to run a set of tests. But it's not going to get you any kind of, um, you know, uh, multi multi node testing it's not going to get you any kind of scale uh, testing or even performance because these VMs are pretty slow so I well so Chris to clarify I I saw this as more of a, a place to spin up an, a test instance of an application under development and just poke at it I mean I know we can do it locally but there are some aspects to these decentralized applications that really need to be run like in production, but so this is like somewhere between testing on your desktop and being in full production. That's how I saw it because the CI pipelines already have soak tests and performance tests going. I mean, I know the Sawtooth team does that and I know the Fabric yeah, like team I does said, that. They can, only, they can only test in a single VM because we're using OpenStack basically is spin up a VM. Uh -oh. We're all, you know, we'll just okay. do a bunch of containers inside there and kick the tires. We aren't doing anything more extensive than that as far as I know, on any so, of the projects. I, I know that Tong had worked, Tong Lee had worked for quite a while to spin up like four node using Cello, right? To spin up four nodes in uh, 
in our service provider and do yeah. long running tests. And I don't know whatever happened to that because I have no yeah, I'm, on the team. Yeah, I mean that may be the case. I don't know. So, yeah, well, on on the Sawtooth team, we we do uh, something quite a bit more significant than that. So we're we're regularly spinning up ten node networks with with uh, between medium and large nodes on AWS and driving max load at those for periods of one, three, and seven days, depending on what what the purpose of that test cycle is. And I'm assuming that, that Intel is paying for that. Intel has been footing the bill for that. So, right. I mean, we're doing, yeah, yeah. And, and IBM is doing something similar internally where we're spinning up on the IBM cloud and doing some things. Um, well, and we, I would add there that the Indies had to do the same thing. And one of the things we've noticed is that if you don't do a network that scales across data centers, meaning you don't do a globally spanning network, you don't see a lot of the same performance issues yeah, as if you exactly. spin it all up in one data center. Right, exactly. And a lot of the value of this sort of network is is the interoperability testing, meaning that you're on a network along with other folks. Because yeah. if you're just doing testing for just one thing or just one set of benchmarks, um, you know, doing that privately is is usually easier than trying to coordinate with a pool of nodes that are being run for other people for other purposes. Um, to, to give my perspective from uh, from Barrow. Yeah, we're doing something similar with long running test nets of um, between like seven and 12 nodes that we might run for up to a week or two weeks. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll just continually redeploy a load of um, Ethereum contracts or create some synthetic uh, traffic on, on those. Yeah, we, we're putting them across different data centers and things like that. Um, oftentimes this is revealing issues with Burrow. So it, it seems to be part of Burrow testing and currently Monex uh, it is paying for that. Um, so I mean, part of it would just be, it would be nice if the cost of that was borne or mutualized with Hyperledger because it's, you know, a not insignificant cost for a startup to be yeah. uh, be running yeah. that stuff. Um, I think, yeah, so, so for us, we run on Kubernetes. So like a Kubernetes namespace that did borrow would be ideal for what we'd want. I think there might be another another angle to this once these networks are, are running uh, that, that maybe there's an ability to start playing with stuff um, between different namespaces, but the, the, the other thing is that unlike in test CI test or a benchmark that might run to completion, uh, it's useful that when these uh, networks get me messed up, if you can manually go in and poke around. So often on some shorter automated tests, I might have seen some issues, uh, but then I lose the state. Um, so it's kind of nice if these are semi-manual for, for me anyway. Yeah, so, so uh, Silas, I think the, the key thing from my perspective is that with everybody essentially doing stuff behind the curtain of, um, uh, you know, their own corporate uh, test in environment and so forth, we're unable to sort of leverage the community, right? So nobody can help come in and, and write tests or, you know, examine the, the, the output and, and contribute in some way to that aspect of things because it's not public. I'd like to make it public personally. Um, I keep pushing for more and more of our internal testing to be externalized. Um, and with every release, we're doing more and more of that, um, uh, transferring things out into, into the community. But again, when we start thinking about running scale of, you know, let's get 128 nodes or something like that running, um, uh, and then tear it down after a while, uh, that becomes a very different prospect in terms of how, um, you know, we can allocate uh, our, our, our test environment and it's probably going to, you know, be the case that again, if we're, if we're, if we're running Kubernetes, for instance, pardon me, then, you know, does LF provide support for running Kubernetes, right? <laughs> right. Or do we, well, you know, do we an get it from, you know, an IBM or an Azure or whoever, right? That's an interesting point you bring up, Chris, because one of the goals I had personally was to use the test to drive the development of the, the standard, you know, Kubernetes composable configs and Helm charts, the, the effort that we began this summer right. to right. try to make these things deployable across cloud platforms much easier. So that would be one way to engage the community in your testing process would be, hey, we're going to build this really giant, you know, scaling test. We need to 
you know, here, here's our Kubernetes configs and everything like that and, and have all that be public and then spin it up on the network. Yeah. Um, I'd love, I'd but, love to have that. I mean, and, and that's, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the $64,000 question, and I don't know if it's costing that much or not, but is, can we get access be, to, I, I, again, it, it, you know, if this is something where end users are not participating as part of the development of the various projects can just spin up a fabric or sawtooth or a Roja and so forth and, and burrow and kick the tires and run smart contracts that they've written, that's, that's a user testnet. That's like the Ethereum testnet, right? You, Testnet for Ethereum is not to test Ethereum, it's to test my smart contract. And if, right. if we're instead saying, no, we're testing Burrow, we're testing Fabric, we're testing Sawtooth and so forth, then um, I, I would like to see that. And we should you know, seriously consider if we're all doing or leveraging Kubernetes to, um, uh, to do sort of more um, uh, production-like kind of deployments, then uh, I, I think we should explore you know, not, you know, how, how do we, how do we, how do we get a, 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 a K8, you know, service that we can share as part of our CI, just like we're doing with, I can't remember Rai who it was, but whoever it is. So, so Chris, just, just to make sure, um, kind of understand that, that all of the major platforms are doing some level of large scale tests with resources that they're contributing. Uh, IBM is contributing stuff for Fabric, Intel's helping to support AWS yeah. deployments for Sawtooth. We already have this sort of controlled, uh, long running high load tests that we're running. What, what I hear from you and Nathan and others and what has been my experience is um, you tend to fix the controlled tests, but it's really hard to get the uncontrolled test. Um, you know, where you're running on a network that drops every third packet for some bizarre reason, um, uh, or you've got you know some highly heterogeneous set of links in it that that suddenly expose some timing problems. Are, are you, when you talk about testing the platforms in this case, like what you're suggesting with Kubernetes? Is the objective here to get those, um, to identify the randomness and the weirdness and the unpredictable situations? Or is it, I mean, the other part of this is, the other random factor in here is what do people, what do real people do with my application that I didn't really understand they were going to do with my application and I just need to get something out so a community can, can abuse it? Um, well, so I can, I can only speak to the kinds of things that we're looking at and basically we're looking for the things that, um, you know, that Nathan was sort of articulating that there are certain, um, uh, you know, when, when you, when you, when you cross network boundaries, when you are crossing data center boundaries, when you are working on, um, uh, you know, with, with, uh, significant scale and or performance, then you start running into issues that you might not otherwise uncover if you're just doing sort of small scale testing. Right. Um, and so the intention here is to find those things in the community rather than behind the curtain of some company's own you know, sort of, I'll, I'll put the word proprietary and it's not really proprietary, I mean, but uh, proprietary testing that they're currently paying for, but that is not visible and not accessible to the community either to review the output and or contribute to uh, improving those tests and so forth. Um, I mean, I'd love to have all the chaos and scale and performance testing done out in the open for Fabric. That'd be wonderful from my perspective. And I suspect- yeah. You know, uh, saw so, and everybody else feels the same. Yeah, maybe one I, I other thing I can add that isn't uh, necessarily repetitive with what I've said before is um, if we wanted to open up the networks that we're already running, which are in a way open but not advertised, the an obstacle for, the, for uh, to me for that is just the the security administration of of the hosts themselves. So as you're thinking about what we could potentially do with budget, 
certainly the cost of of operating the systems is one thing from from like a, the cloud cost perspective. But if you're looking at adding on a, a sysadmin or something like that, think about how many of those systems that sysadmin could um, protect and, and manage. And maybe there's some sort of baseline figure where we can say, even if Hyperledger isn't hosting a hundred nodes, uh, you know, if they're hosting, I don't know, let's say just two nodes per project, just to have a number there. Uh, the sysadmin cost around that. I think, you know, you, you mentioned that you were hosting yours on um, uh, Amazon. On, uh, Amazon. Uh, we're actually using sort of the internal version of the IBM cloud. So it's, you know, chargeback as opposed to, you know, we're paying a bill. And I, I can't just, you know, share the IPs and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I need so, another place to bring stuff to. I could, it could be the IBM public cloud and, but, you know, then there's a whole matter of billing and everything you have to sort out. Yeah. I'm just trying to throw out some ideas for budget. So regardless yeah. of where it's hosted, having, having somebody to, to help secure those, that's a cost that I don't know how to deal with right now. Uh, the thing we've right. already talked about is the, the cost of the platforms themselves. And maybe you can do two different tiers there. One where there's uh, just say a couple seed nodes provided by, uh, Hyperledger, and then the rest of the community and the other companies are, are adding the the girth of the population, and then a second tier where where uh, Hyperledger is funding a lot of nodes, and that might be important for for projects that don't necessarily have as deep of pockets behind them, uh, and help. And then uh, there's 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 also the sort of the cross cloud, <laughs> you know, you know. Um, you know Testing that, you know, something that's, you know, where there's nodes that are running on Amazon, on Azure, on IBM, on Google, wherever, right? Um, mm -hmm. And making sure that that all. So there's yeah, another it, hand up for a while. Oh, sorry. Can you guys, can you guys hear me? Can now. Yes, we can hear you. Can you yeah. still hear me? Uh, okay. Hey, so the, the, if we hired somebody, a human, that significantly raises the table stakes. Um, I'm also concerned about losing the, you know, sort of the non accounted for financial contributions from the member companies. I would love to still leverage that. So just to throw it out as another idea, um, I don't know if it's even possible, but it would be cool if the <laughs> member companies that are already running testing right now to provide um, cloud space for running pods so that we could have a heterogeneous pool of pods to do Kubernetes deploys on. So we could actually do, you know, uh, heterogeneous cross provider deploys of these networks. Um, and I, I also like the idea of limiting this to just teams, right? And not opening it up to sort of the general public. Although, um, and, and I mean, what I mean by that is like our working groups, you know, I think the educational materials working groups should be in there, you know, going to the documentation and, you know, that they're using to, to teach with to make sure that the, the steps are accurate. Um, architecture working groups should be able to poke at stuff along with the development teams, right? And uh, I guess if we did the Dave, gonna... possible, yeah. Sorry, uh, Arno sorry, was trying to get in here a couple times. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I mean, sorry. so... No, I just wanted to bring up another aspect which was mentioned in the past and that has not been brought up in this discussion at all, which was the this notion of having some test nets for hackers. Because, you know, as the bug bounty program was unsuccess so successful and one of the reasons seemed to be that it's too much of a hassle for hackers to get even the network set up to get bounding on, you know. And so we had mentioned... Uh, you know, the possibility of redirecting some of the money that was initially dedicated to the bug bounty program to setting up test nests so hackers could have an easier way at, you know, getting started. Yeah, um, Silas, I, I was a little surprised that that Bro didn't chime in that, that uh, having a, a test net in the Ethereum test net sense was, it didn't seem to be your first priority. So, uh, yeah, I was going to come in to respond to a few things going back to what, what Mick originally said. So 
So one thing is the, the way that I think I would see, see these networks, at least initially, would be that uh, human level of investigation. So you often might end up writing the automated tests after stuff you discover on these longer running networks. When we're testing them, we end up throwing application level code at the, at the chain because that's the, one of the better ways to start um, generating types of faults and issues. Um, so I don't know, insofar as it would be possible to, uh, to be a little vague about what they're for initially, but actually lower the barriers of getting them set up. So I like the idea of a multi-master Kubernetes um, deployment across different clouds. I like the idea of a, a base load being provided by, um, by Hyperledger. But I think there's also like a human administrator would be really handy in this. So there's a few cluster level admin things that are, that are a pain that you could do if, if a, an admin was managing the masters and maybe just a few extra nodes. There's also things like Elastic Stack for logging, um, uh, Kibana and stuff like that, just for looking at metrics. All of that stuff could, I would have thought, be reasonably easily shared. So if that was there, then I think test nets, whether they're for some level of application, I think it's maybe tricky having, like, we don't want to have to provide a high level of service to just random punters wanting to deploy applications. But I think we, we could probably have a better idea about how exactly they should be used once we started doing investigative test level stuff, maybe some benchmarking, maybe some, like, um, inviting hackers stuff, maybe some, you know, putting up some applications that, that we know put strain on the, the chains. Like, I don't know whether we, we'd have to decide between those to start with, but having some level, basic level of infrastructure that was somewhat managed would be, would be useful. Yeah, hi, this is, this is Leonard. Just um, my observations. I think everything that we're saying seems to point us in the direction of having a governed environment somewhere in the cloud that we can call a testnet, but also based on the performance and scale metrics that have recently been published. This is the point of that working group. And from a collaborative um, and interoperability perspective, if we can bring all that together to instantiate a testnet that each of the projects can use, that can be configured to provide the benchmarking that's, is it, was that Silas who just talked about? And, um, and the rest of the team. Um, so literally to me, that would be money better spent because you, could, right, then have you. A, you could then have a chargeback model back to the different projects as well as Hyperledger. Something like that would have value that can be configured for everyone um, uh -huh. going forward. We Thanks. Thank you, Leonard. And we're at the end of time, so I, I, I'd I guess, like to quickly propose a potential right turn here. Is I'm looking at cooperating with some of the universities. The universities in the Boston area have uh, what's called the Mass Open Cloud, where they have thousands of physical machines. That um, you know, maybe we can get time on those, and maybe get students to manage them. You know, if we set up some stuff with universities or something. Yeah, I think recruiting from universities or, or elsewhere is great. Uh, so we are out of time here, uh, Dave. Clearly, there's many ways we can spend any amount of money that, that you can uh, you want to suggest on the budget. So uh, please keep pursuing that. And thanks, everybody, for your time right. at uh, today's meeting. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.